You may be seated. As you're being seated, go ahead and take your Bibles. If you have them, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is where we'll spend our time today. 1 Corinthians 12, and uh, I'm going to read verses 1 through 11 as you turn there. So if you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the pew, a a black, hardback one. And uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm going to read verses 1 through 11 today. It says this, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between the Spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues." All of these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So that's going to be our text this morning. We'll break it apart a little bit. We're continuing. We're almost actually finished with the sermon series, our core commitment sermon series. uh, And we're talking about our core commitment to serving together today. Talking about Camp Gilead reminded me of a story from way back in the day. My youth ministry days, one year we decided that regular camp wasn't enough for the kids, and so we needed to take the students to an adventure camp. So we found a camp called Camp Bighorn in Montana, and it was a Christian adventure camp. And by adventure camp, I mean that you go, and rather than dirt boarding or archery and some of the things that are an adventure at Camp Gilead, like the cabins, you would get to Bighorn, and as you were there, they would take you out into the, onto these different adventures. You would go rock climbing. You would go whitewater rafting. One of my personal favorites was you would go whitewater rafting. Uh, that was an experience. I'll tell you about it at a different time. I can't say some of the things that were said there from the pulpit. But uh, we decided to take the kids on this, these adventure-based activities with this camp. And the whole idea was that you would take the group on this activity, would stretch them physically, stretch them spiritually, stretch them emotionally, and then they would come back from the event, whatever the event was, and they would talk about it. What did you learn? And they would relate that to Scripture. And that was the whole idea behind the, the events. Well, they told us about one event that they were going to have us do as we were there together, and it was called Broken Body. Now, as a youth pastor, I wanted to pull the leader card on that one, right? Hey, you know what? I'm going to sit this one out, and I'm going to make sure that... And I was in my 20s at the time. And so I was like, all right, let's go. Let's do this. I was like, you know, at that point, I still needed to be stronger than the youth group guys, and so I was going to show them what was up, and it was going to be great and fun and amazing. So they load us in the van, and they take us out to the middle of nowhere, and they drop us off, and they lead us out to this spot, and they gave us several things that we were going to use for this adventure. One of them was a GPS, and that was before GPS, like everybody had it on their phone. It was this old school GPS unit. They gave us some coordinates, and they told us that our job was that we were going on basically a glorified scavenger hunt. And at the end, there would be treasure that we would want. And that treasure was a cooler full of soda and candy. And it was Montana, and it was the summer, so it was really hot, and we were really excited to go. And so we're ready, we're chomping at the bit, and we're ready to go. We're going to do, they had told us it's going to take you a a better part of the, uh, really the whole morning to be out there and go do what you're going to do. And so uh, we're out in the woods in the middle of where we don't know. And so they got ready to say, okay, on your mark, I said go. But right before they said go, they said, hang on a second. This is called broken body. And what they started to do is dole out these different brokenness or ailments to each one of us as part of this team. So one guy had no use of his legs. Somebody else was blind. Someone else couldn't use their arms. One person was actually allergic to things that made them just start screaming out of the middle of nowhere and like losing their mind. And they had like a mental issue of some sort. So they gave us all of these different ailments and things that we were supposed to, uh, we had to do as we went along. And then they had leaders that would enforce the ailments. So we're in the woods and we're in the mountains in Montana. Did I mention rattlesnakes? 
They had told us that there were rattlesnakes, too. So, like, we were concerned. And I had a bunch of kids from University Place with us, right? It was me and Linz, a couple of other folks. We don't get to Montana a whole bunch. I didn't even know how to use the GPS. But we had to do things that day, including we had to build a raft from scratch. We had to, like, go around and find all these different things and build a raft and cross, like, an actual river, right? And we had to go and, and, and do a variety of activities as we're on this scavenger hunt, and it was a big deal. Kids were carrying other kids, like, on their back. One guy, you know, a big strong guy, had to carry someone else, and they're carrying them along for a while, and then they stopped because it was too easy, and, and, and the leaders, the facilitators, said, oh, you know what, you just broke your leg. The kid's like, no, I'm fine. No, you just broke your leg. So then we're having to, like, carry this kid around. And we went through, I was actually, if I remember right, you have to remind me, I, I think mine was blindness. And so I literally, they, I put a blindfold on. And so like type A driven aggressive guy had to be led along by the hand the entire time by like a junior high girl. <laughs> whose, whose, whose gift it was to be one of the leaders. Because certain people got gifts and their gifts were supposed to offset our ailments. And we were supposed to figure out how to work together to accomplish this task. 17 hours later, they called in search and rescue. No, I'm just kidding. That didn't happen. <laughs> no, but we did find the treasure, and we ate, and it was amazing, and we had a great time. But as we sat around, the point of the exercise, as they debriefed, as they talked about it, was how that is a picture of how God has made the church, right? That, that there's, there's ailments and issues and baggage and hardships and things that are difficult, but then there are also gifts and there are abilities. And the goal is for all of those things to work together, to balance each other, and to, to be working in such a way that you accomplish the goal that God has given you. So there were positive aspects where we had people who worked together. Positive aspects where people who said, I, I can't do this because of this ailment that's been given to me. I must rely on you to help me. And, and positive aspects where somebody would come in and say, I'm going to help you and I'm going to bring you along. Did you know there were also some negative aspects that happened that day? Some of those students saw some things from their youth pastor that they probably shouldn't have seen from a youth pastor who was very frustrated. There were times when we yelled and screamed and argued with each other, and it wasn't because that was what they told us to do. It was because that was our human nature. There were times when people wanted to quit, and people wanted to leave, and people wanted to walk away, and somebody said, I'm not doing my job anymore. I've had it. I'm tired of this. I think it really is a picture of the church, isn't it? When the Apostle Paul wrote this first, what we call 1 Corinthians, it was his second letter to the Corinthian, the church in ancient Corinth, they were a broken body. Like, it was a broken church. It was a messy church in lots of different ways. One of those ways was how they were serving together. They were a broken body and how they were using and misusing and abusing and misinterpreting and misunderstanding their spiritual gifts. And so when Paul writes the words that I just read to you to them, he's writing them to a church who's in fact broken in the way that they're supposed to work together and serve together. And so what we want to see today in looking at these verses is how can we as a church continue to serve well together? We've been blessed by many people who love to serve here and love to do different things and use their gifts. But we want to make sure we remain committed to that here at our church and so we'll look and we'll see some ways today that God is going to continue to help us remain committed to serving each other so that we can be a healthy body and not a broken body. We'll start in verse 1. 1 Corinthians 12, 1, and we're going to see this. We're going to see, if I can get that to work, there we go. We're going to see some of the tools for serving together. Chapter 12, verse 1, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. Apparently, they were uninformed, misinformed, disinformed about what spiritual gifts were and how they were supposed to be deployed and used. And I would say that the church today is in much the same spot. As a matter of fact, the idea of spiritual gifts is one of the more debated, misunderstood areas uh, in Scripture amongst Christians today. This is not a message, a, a, a complete explanation on all the spiritual gifts and how they work. I'll make some comments, and I'll talk a little bit, and then I'll offer uh, the opportunity if you'd like to talk more about it at a different time. But we realize there are different, a variety of different opinions and ideas and ideologies, philosophies of what Scripture's talking about 
when it's talking about spiritual gifts. Even as I read down through there in verses 8, 9, and 10 as I was reading, some of those gifts that some people believe are no longer in existence today, and some people believe are fully in existence as much today as they were in the first century, and some who really aren't sure. And the way that we hold those positions is important. But it's important for us to open God's word and to be honest with God's word and to say we want to be informed about what God has given us because God has given us something called spiritual gifts. Now, when you see there it says now concerning spiritual gifts, it's actually just one word in the original language, spirituals, but the context helps us to understand that he's in fact talking about gifts. I'll talk about that more in just a minute. Some of us would ask, like, what is a spiritual gift? Like, how do I know what a spiritual gift is? Give me a definition. Lots of definitions running around out here. Here's one that I was given in seminary from Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology. A spiritual gift is any ability that is empowered by the Holy Spirit, and it's used in ministry in the church. Any ability that's empowered by the Holy Spirit? You see, sometimes I think that we think spiritual gifts are are things like, well, the pastor must have a spiritual gift, or the musicians must have a spiritual gift, or definitely the people that work in nursery have a spiritual gift, right? But Grudem argues, and, and many other scholars argue, that a spiritual gift is really any ability that is empowered by the Holy Spirit and is used in ministry in the church. And and some people will call them natural abilities with supernatural purposes supernatural empowerment. I'll get into that empowerment piece in a minute and how that works. But I want you to think about whatever it is that God has given you as a spiritual gift. Could it really be that any ability that I have could be a spiritual gift? So we'll dig in a little bit more. I'm going to show you that there are four lists in Scripture when we start talking about spiritual gifts and what are they and how do they work and let's figure out the list. There are about four lists in Scripture uh, Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Ephesians 4, and 1 Peter 4 all talk about things that they call spiritual gifts. And this is the list of what is on there. Feel free to take a picture of the screen at any time. If you need me to move, just give me a hand signal, right? But all of these different things that are listed up there are different things that are actually listed in the Bible as, quote, spiritual gifts. Now, one of the things that's important, it says on the bottom, that this is understood as a representative list and not exhaustive. And why do I say that? Each of the four places that you turn to has some of the same things listed, and they each have some different things listed. So it's not as if we have one list where here are all of the gifts that you can have. We'll put those down, and then you take a test, an inventory, and you figure out which one or two or three is yours, and then you use those. What it seems like the writers are doing, because you have at least two different writers, Peter and Paul, who are giving these lists of gifts, is that they are saying that there are a variety of different gifts. Here are many of them. Maybe you look at that list and you're like, man, I'm really good at apostleship. Well, we'll talk about that maybe in in private. If you're not writing scripture, and you're not, uh, probably you're not an apostle. But maybe you're good at, at having faith. Right? Maybe you're really good at giving. Anybody? No, don't, don't raise your hand. Serving. Maybe there's some of the, the you're like, I, I, I see that on that list. I'm like, I think that could be my thing. I, I, I get that. One of the things that's tricky is when you take some of these different ones and you look at what, what they are and try to define them, they have a variety of different like, definitions and, and applications. Right? So administration. Um, does that mean the church secretary? Because I guarantee you one thing, man, the kids' ministry needs some serious administration, right? There are lots of different ways that each of these gifts play out. We also believe that not every gift that's a spiritual gift is included on these lists in Scripture. That we're getting some general ideas about what gifts could be. So just quickly, um, as you look at those gifts, that list of gifts, you'll probably realize that they could fall into two categories. You have natural abilities... Right? And most of those are natural abilities. There are about three, maybe four of them that w- would, would be considered miraculous gifts. Right, Especially healing and prophecy and tongues, depending on how you define those, would be considered miraculous gifts. Now, the church, this church holds a, what's known as a cessationist view of gifts. If you're not sure what that is, talk to me later. Uh, even within that position, there's like variety of what that means. Lauren and I both believe like God is still at work in this world. God is still at work supernaturally in this world. I think that a lot of people 
have misused and misunderstood spiritual gifts and applied them only to two or three miraculous things, and without really thinking through what they were even used for in the historical context and why they were there and how that would show up today, have maybe abused those gifts in a very experiential culture, okay? So without saying a lot more than that, if you have more questions about those sign gifts, miraculous gifts, come and chat with me. Um, I would not consider myself what is a, called a strict cessationist, okay? Um, but if you have more questions about that, please come and talk to me because we want to be open and we realize different people hold different views on this. We want to continue to journey through that together. As we talk about spiritual gifts today, we are talking mainly, in, by application, we are talking about natural abilities that God supernaturally uses. That when you become a Christian, there are some natural abilities that you already have, or maybe some things that God gives you that you develop, that he wants to use for the building up of his body, for the building up of the church. And those things are called spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts... We need to think of them as the tools that God has given to build up his church. Ephesians 4 talks about that, other places. But as you think about having the tools for serving together, I want you to think about the idea of having the tools in our toolbox as a church to accomplish exactly what God has called us to. And I went deep into the archives again today to help us understand that. I, f I went all the way back to the janitor's closet. Thank you, sir. And I found the official, are you ready? I have found the official PCBC church toolbox. It says it right there. You see it? I didn't write that on there. Uh, there's a phone number. Please do not remove. Okay? This is the official church toolbox. And when you open this, this is like a, what, 150-year-old building, right? Jim, you've been here the whole time. It's about, <laughs> about right. I can't even see him, and I just, man, sorry, Jim. Right? No, this is an old building. We've been doing some looking around at some remodeling ideas, and we're realizing this is an old building, right? In this toolbox is everything we need to fix every problem at this church. No, absolutely. Why? Because I've opened this already, and I found several of them. Now, this toolbox probably looks a lot like your toolbox at home, maybe, okay? There's a lot of junk in it. Does anybody have a toolbox with a lot of junk and mess and stuff like that in it? Come on, Really? I've been to some of your homes, okay. But here's the thing. We've got screwdrivers, of a, and I did not, I pulled this out of the janitor's closet this morning and just opened the lid. I didn't do anything else with it. We have a variety of sizes of screwdrivers. They're good for stuff, right? Like, you can fix stuff with those. We've got, I think that these are meat thermometers. I think, Roger, you do, do tool, is that meat thermometers? Anyway, yeah. Something to do with electricity there. There are some drill bits that haven't been opened yet. That's good. And, of course, what every toolbox needs, because it's the most important tool of all time, not one, but two hammers, because sometimes you might have to use this end and this end at the same time. Is that a thing? People <laughs> can do that, right? I got to thinking about this toolbox and what's in here, and like sometimes literally we'll be like, oh, no, we got to do X, Y, Z. Grab the toolbox. And inevitably what happens is we come in here and we dig around and, and what? The right tool is just not there. So then you get a hammer and you improvise with whatever tool that you needed it to be, right? But as I thought about it, you look through here and you got like wire nuts. You've got this thing for stripping, uh, stripping wires. Yes, good. You got this thing for telling us stuff is level. I think it's actually called a level. Not very level because how many times it's been thrown around. And lots of parts. And of course, <clears throat> I think it used to be a glove at one point. If our spiritual toolbox at PCBC looks like this, we're in trouble, right? It's, it, by strict standard definition, it is a toolbox, and there are tools in there. I would argue that it has been maybe mildly neglected. I, I would argue that maybe there's been a tool or 15 borrowed from the toolbox and not returned. And probably some of them reside at some of your homes. But as you think about this toolbox and what it's intended to do around here, keep things running, you think, does this, is this going to get the job done? Probably not. Well, that's why it's a good thing, and this is a gentle illustration. But I found this other toolbox that's back there, and I, all the tools in here I know how to use. But what I like about this toolbox is, first of all, 
like it's all organized. Look how amazing that is. Almost everything's here. One or two things may be missing. But all your basic tools are right here and usable. Chris Berry, which one are you going for? This one or that one? Say this one. There you go, right? All the tools are there and available and useful and organized and nice. And you know what? I didn't do this either. I just picked the two of them up. As we think about our spiritual toolbox at PCBC, like this, okay, I know the illustration is a little tricky, but this is what we're shooting for. We want a toolbox where the tools are there and they're in place and they're ready to be used and they're available and all the tools that are necessary to do the job are there. That means serving together, right? As you think about the tools that are necessary, one of the things that people ask frequently is, well, like, how do I find my spiritual gift, right? How do I discover my spiritual gift? How many of you have taken one of those tests? Raise your hands, be proud. Well, that's not bad, right? The spiritual gifts inventories, when I was in college, it was a big deal, right? They took like Myers-Briggs and they spiritualized it and it was like, look, your spiritual gifts. I'm like, that's weird because it looks exactly like that other test. Finding your spiritual gift, discovering your spiritual gift. Here's what I'd say about that. Finding your spiritual gift is probably more about discerning the spiritual purposes for things that you're already good at rather than being like zapped by a spiritual superpower, okay? For many of us, we think that what's going to happen is that like somehow we're going to get zapped and we're going to be amazing at something that we were totally terrible at before, okay? I've been open and honest about, from this stage, about my proclivities with tools, especially power tools, right? I'm not going to wake up one morning and be able to build homes, okay? I came in this morning, and the band was warming up and stuff like that, and Lauren said, hey, can you play piano for us? I said, I think my spiritual gift is, like, not playing piano, right? But I want us to think about spiritual gifts and finding my spiritual gift, maybe, or discerning that as, as asking this question, where is there a need in the body, and how has God positioned me to meet it? As opposed to just kind of waiting around until I feel some like buzz from the Lord and I'm good at something that I was never good at before or thinking that the only spiritual gifts are, happen on this stage or something like that, to realize that we all have a gift, that if you're a Christian, you have spiritual gifts. And maybe finding that spiritual gift is just saying, what is it that needs to be done and how has God already equipped me to be able to help and to be able to do that? I love it when I see people come and use their gifts, and some don't even know that that's what they're doing or what that is. But when people come and they do a lot of behind-the-scenes kinds of things, that's huge for us. One of the, like, the fundamental presuppositions that Lauren and I carry into this whole task is that God would never give us something to do and not give us the tools to accomplish it. In other words, God's never going to call this church to do something and not give us the people with the gifts and the abilities to carry that out. And that drives how we do ministry here. We're not going to just start a bunch of ministries and then look for leaders to fill all of those ministries. As a matter of fact, outside of maybe just a few things, if we don't have right leadership for a ministry, we won't do the ministry. Which reminds me, I'm going to talk about coffee in a little while. You might think about whether or not God has that on your heart, because if we didn't have coffee for a week because we didn't have the people to make the coffee for the week, Someone will be discovering their spiritual gifts fast. <laughs> we'll get to that later. But we believe that God has given us and will continue to give us exactly what he wants us to have to do what he's called us to do. The question for each of you who are Christians is, how might I be part of that? How might I be part of that toolbox? So he's given us the tools. We'll read a few more verses to see that he's also given us the power. I want to read verses 4, 5, and 6. And then also verse 11. Verse 4 says, There are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. Verse 11. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Back up in verse 4, that word gifts. There are varieties of gifts. The word that's here is, is the same place where we get the, 
from, from the uh, original language, the same place that we get the word grace. The root word here is the same place where we get the word grace. These are gifts of grace. And the reason that that is important is because any spiritual gift is a manifestation of God's grace to the church. Meaning that whether God's given me a gift or given you a gift, or as you use your gifts and you use the things that God has given you and you build up the church, that's God pouring out his grace on the church. Sometimes you actually hear of them as called grace gifts. Manifestations of the way that God pours out his grace. In addition to that, it helps us to think that serving is actually a spiritual activity. Anything that you do to serve the church is actually a spiritual activity. And that can be really easy to see when Mark's up here playing the guitar. And man, he's so spiritual. What a spiritual activity. But when Danette, who just came in from kids ministry, is leading our kids men, like that's a spiritual activity. Amen, Danette? And sometimes we need some more spiritual maturity there <laughs> than we do over here. That means that pulling weeds in the church parking lot can be seen as a, as a spiritual activity. That means that helping to clean things around here, that hosting a small group or leading a small group or any of those things are all spiritual activities, which really puts a, a different twist, a different spin on the things that we do. That we're not just serving, that we're not just kind of doing something that needs to get done, that it's actually a spiritual activity. And what I love in this text is the Trinitarian nature of that. If you missed it, look at verse 4. It says, varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. Varieties of service, but the same Lord, that's Jesus. Varieties of activities, but the same God. That proper exercise of the spiritual gifts is a Trinitarian activity. In other words, like the fullness of the Godhead is involved when we serve together and we work together. That this just isn't just us showing up and putting on a show or us showing up and, and pulling some weeds or doing some stuff. That this is actually like the body of Christ at work. Verse 6 and verse 11 say the same word. It says that it's the same God who empowers them all in everyone. And verse 11 says all these are empowered by the one and the same spirit. The word empowers is the word energizes. That the Holy Spirit gives us the energy to do that work. We can get tired in ministry. Amen? Like if you've done ministry for a long time, man, you can, you can get tired in ministry sometimes as pastors we get tired for the people who have been running the ministry for a long time you'd be like i've been pouring a lot of time and energy and effort into it and i'm tired from the ministry i can either try to amp myself up and and get myself excited or i can rely on the holy spirit to empower me for that ministry as a matter of fact i try every time before i come out here on sunday mornings to spend five minutes or so in my office and just saying god give me your power like, this is about you, not about me. You empower, energize me to do this ministry. So if it's like, you know, if I'm too, too much up here, blame it on him. Don't blame me, right? Some weeks, he's, there's more energizing than others. Some weeks, it's the energizer bunny up here, right? But we all need the energy of the Holy Spirit, the energy that God gives us to do the ministry that he's called us to. Verse 7 says this. There we go. They give us the purpose for serving together. Verse 7 says, To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. How many people does that say have, have a manifestation of the Spirit? To who? To each. Now, to each means who? All. All of us who are Christians. Okay, And down in verse 12 and 13, he expounds on that. That the Holy Spirit gives everyone who is a Christian gifts. He says, to each is given a manifestation. We say every member is a minister, right? And that doesn't mean every church member at Puyallup Community Baptist Church. That means every member of the body of Christ is a minister. And what that means is that everyone has a role to play. Everyone who's a Christian has a role to play in the body of Christ. Every role is important. And sometimes what happens is that we get sidelined because we think, well, my role is not as important or I'm not as good as that guy at that thing or whatever. But, but God has given each of us a role to play and each role is important. There was an interesting illustration about these kids who wanted to play sandlot baseball and they went out together and they wanted to play but they didn't have the equipment to play. 
And so there was one of the neighbors that saw them trying to play, and he felt bad for them, and he wanted to do something to encourage them, and so he bought them enough equipment to play. He bought, half, uh, he bought enough mitts for half of them to have mitts. He bought a bat, and he bought a uh, ball. And he sent them out, and they were going to play baseball. And enough people were out in the field that they had the gloves, and then the guy with the ball, and then the guy with the bat, and they were going to go, and they were going to play, and then they were going to switch teams, and so they were going to share the glove, and they were going to, the different baseball gloves, and the bat, and the ball, and they were going to all work together and play, which worked for about 15 minutes because they were like little boys, right? And then what happened is that Tommy got upset and got frustrated, and he was going to take his mitt, and he was going to go home. Now we're down a mitt. What are we going to do? So then Billy's out there with his bare hands, and he's ready to go, and he's like, I'll just play like this, right? And then Johnny's got the bat, and somebody calls a strike, and it wasn't a strike, and he went crazy and went Bo Jackson and snapped the bat over his knee. You guys remember that, Bo Jackson? Okay. Right, snaps the bat over his knee, and now we've got like two bats, but they're only small pieces of bats, and what are we supposed to do with these two bats over here, right? So Tommy goes and tries to get some duct tape from Dad, and we're going to try to fix it, and that didn't work, but now we got a kind of a bat. And then they had the ball, and then the little guy who was pitching, he decided that he didn't like what was happening either, and, and just fighting and arguing ensued. And rather than a baseball game, they had a yelling match and an arguing match, and everybody ended up going their own separate ways. That's one of the things that continues to happen as, we, as you think about serving, when we think about the gifts as being our own. I want you to see the last two words down there on the screen. It says, for to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit. For what? For the common good. What we have to realize is, that, like, my gift isn't for me. My gift also isn't from me. I am not God's gift to the church. Amen? We're not God's gift to the church. What we are is stewards of God's gift. What can happen is this, is that some people think, like, well, I've got my gift, and it's my gift, and I know how to use it, and I'm really good with it, and it's mine. No, it's not your gift. Or some people think, like, I have this gift, and I will share it with all of you, and how lucky you are to have it, right? Your gift isn't for you, and your gift isn't from you. It's a gift of God, from God, to the church. You're just the person standing there with it in your hands, stewarding it well. You carry a great deal of responsibility. I carry a great deal of responsibility. Every person who stands on this stage and does music carries responsibility. The people who are sitting in the pews who have gifts and aren't using them, you carry a, a responsibility. Not to me as the pastor, not to Lauren as the pastor. You carry a responsibility before God to use those gifts, to serve together. We all know what it's like to go to the toolbox and the tool that you need is missing, right? Right? We all know what it's like to go to the toolbox and the, the piece that you need is broken. At the end of the day, God has given each of us things that we can do to continue to build up the body of Christ, and it's for the common good. Ephesians 4 lays it out, and it says the pastor's job is for equipping, the, minister's jo or the, the people's job is for doing ministry, and the reason is that the body of Christ would continue to be built up and strengthened. That's the purpose for serving. Now, I'm going to give you a piece of homework. So if you have your phone or a pencil or something like that ready, because actually the verses that I've read in chapter 12, verses 1 through 11, are part of a huge context, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. This was a big enough deal that Paul wrote what is, we have as three chapters. And so your homework is this. In the rest of 12 through 14, he actually talks about the proper attitude in serving together. And he lays it out. I've given you an outline there. An attitude of unity and diversity. The attitude of love. By the way, 1 Corinthians 13, right? The whole we do it at marriages thing. The context is how, we, how do we use our spiritual gifts. And, and chapter 14, tongues and prophecy. We would get a lot further in our understanding and our uh, ideas of how, to, how those things work if we read chapter 14 thinking about orderliness and, and propriety. So your homework is to go read those and look at that outline and read those and see what it talks about. God has given us the tools for serving together. He's given us the power for serving, us, serving together. And we definitely have a purpose for it. So having said that, I got a big list. You like lists? I got a big list. This is all, no, this is only some of the ways that you can serve together here at PCBC. Now, I expect lots of phones out. 
okay? There are lots of them. What's at the top of the list? The same thing that's at every church that's growing, right? As a matter of fact, if nursery's not at the top of your list, it might be like, for your church. We're thankful that nursery and kids ministry and Awana and those things are like right at the top of the list because those leaders are like, help, we're sinking, we need help. You're like, I don't have that spiritual gift. You have the spiritual gift of taser, then you're good. There are lots of ways that you can get involved in serving, right? I'm excited that we've had some new people coming and saying, we want to help in, in youth ministry. It's been really, really fun. Uh, first impressions and, and greeting, the people who stand at the doors, and if you come with kids, help you find out where to check in your kids. We need some help there. You're like, do you have the spiritual gift of smiling? Uh, then you know what? Maybe that's your spot, right? Uh, one of them, I think I talked about it already, the coffee ministry, right? Paul Kloss has been doing coffee for a lot of years, so give him a round of applause. There you go. I appreciate Paul because when I, when I got here like eight years ago, I said, Paul, I just want to be able to come to church and get a cup of coffee. That's all. I just want to be able to come to church and get a cup of coffee, not take a sip and toss it, right? And I think Paul's done a really good job of that. He found a place that has really good beans and they're local, so we're really cool with that. He's done a good job of making sure that, like, you know, it stays running and stays fresh and stays there. But we would like to free Paul up to be able to do some other things because he happens to be the chairman of our deacons and involved in a lot of other areas, right? And so we're looking for somebody who would head up the coffee ministry, meaning you, I would come in and I would push the button and it would pour the coffee and I'd take it out and then I'd come back and push the button again and then wait a half an hour and push the button again because that's how the machine works. If, you, if you're interested in something like that, talk to Paul Kloss, right? Like, is that a spiritual gift? Like, if you show up on time every week, it is. And I'll tell you what, it's going to help me exercise my spiritual gifts, so thank you, right? Buildings and grounds, uh, men's ministry, ladies' ministry. Uh, that one up there that says visiting and care. Like, there are a lot of you here, and it's a lot of work for two guys. We would love some people who are people kind of people, who like to talk to people and spend time with people to be able to be involved in some of that. The one that's at the very end of the list, if you don't find one that's there for you, guess what you could do? You could start a ministry. Some of you maybe have a heart for a specific area. Again, Paul and Debbie Claus had a heart for the schools and for helping out in any way they could in the schools. And so Hands of Hope came out of that, where we take food uh, to some of the schools and help kid, underprivileged kids there. You could start a ministry. So, so I think by way of application, for some of us, God could be calling you to use your tools here at PCBC in one of these ways or in a different way. The QR code is for you to scan. Uh, it'll take you to our Connect card, and we'll get you connected towards serving. So maybe that's your application, is that God wants to use your gifts here. But I want to say something that may be even more important. Maybe God's calling you to use your gifts elsewhere, which may sound weird for a pastor to say. There are a couple aspects to that. We are blessed. Like, it's an abundance of riches sitting in front of me. For a church of our size, and, and what we've been over the last couple years, like, there's an abundance of riches. I'm not telling you to go to another church, but if there's a place where you can use your gifts for the body of Christ, maybe, that, maybe there is somewhere else. Or maybe God is calling you to use your gifts through PCBC to reach outside of PCBC. Because as I put these together, you realize all of them are focused on what happens here, what happens on this campus, what happens around this church. And we don't want to be a church that's just about this. And so maybe God's going to call you to start a ministry or help with a ministry or grow an existing ministry through our church that's out there that we can work together with. So maybe God would call you to use your gifts like elsewhere in that way. What I do know is that God wants each of us who are Christians to use the gifts that he's given us. And we want to be a catalyst for that for this church. And the last thing I'll say before the team comes up and we sing some more is this. That you, you can't use spiritual gifts without having been spiritually regenerated. In other words, if you're not a Christian, you may be good at things, but they're not spiritual gifts. God gives spiritual gifts to Christians. God uses natural abilities that Christians have 
to grow his body. If you're not a Christian today, man, step one is become a Christian, right? Turn your heart, your life, your abilities over to God and say, God, use these in a way that I could never use before. If we can help you in your spiritual journey, we'd love to chat with you. I'd um, love to help you think through what that looks like, okay? I'm going to pray as the team comes forward. God, thank you again for the opportunity to open your word and just see what it has to say about the commitments that we have at this church. And God, I pray that you would challenge and convict us in the ways that we use our gifts, in the ways that we think about gifts. God, that we would continue to be a church that serves together. We're thankful for so many people who do so many things here at the church. And, and God, I pray that we would continue to be a, a church that is grown and matured as an army of people are deployed in, in doing your work here uh, and also in our community and also in, in other places. Give us discernment. I pray that you'd continue to help and, and challenge us to know exactly how to apply what you've given us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hold on, hold on, hold on. So uh, if there weren't as many people here today that we, we know, I wouldn't ask this question in front of everybody because you and I can talk about it on our own, but... I know there are a decent amount of people who are here and maybe have been hurt and whatever, and you're telling us we want everybody to be involved. But people, I know there are some people sitting here saying, hey, I'm not ready for that yet. Can you help us walk through that a little bit about what that might look like? Yeah, one of the things I think we've tried to say, this is impromptu, by the way. Uh, one of the things that we know that we've tried to say quite a bit, because many of you are coming from those places where you've been burnt out in ministry or burnt out on church and things like that, is that sometimes what you got to do is you got to like recharge and refuel, right? Like even if you go to the gym, you have rest days. And I think that's Im important to be able to do that. Um, and the, even chatting with the pastors about that, many of you have done that. Um, to let us help you with that process. We definitely don't want to push people into ministry who have been burned and just who aren't there yet. Um, and so, yeah, I guess that's probably what I would say to it. Okay. And you don't forget, you still have a spiritual gift. At some point, he wants you to use it. So we're, we're happy that you're here. Continue to get healthy. And as God brings you to that place, you've got some gifts. Use it for his glory. Let's stand together. Remember, it's not about us. It's about Christ in us.